Welcome to Behind the Scenes with Joe Danier. Here's a look at some of our most memorable episodes of 2023. If you know a business that should be featured, give us a call or send BJ an email with the information about the company. Enjoy! How long has the business been around and when did you start it? So I started this in 90 and so it's it's soon to be 34 years for us. Nice. And um, it's just been a lot of fun. Um, we've evolved. We've added a lot of things. Uh, we started off doing embroidery. We started with a two-head embroidery machine. Um, then I bought a a single head, then we bought a six head, you know, and then just kind of mushroomed that. Now we've got 38 sewing heads, two of which have lasers on them, so we can do applique stuff. Um, it's just a lot of, uh, and then we've done, I mean, we just started adding and adding and adding, you know, so we got into lasers. Uh, we got uh, Trotec lasers that cut, that in etch, engrave, um, and those things have been pretty busy. So we do tumblers and we cut things out for people like polyester and then we got into doing direct to garment printing now the direct to garment printing back when i got into it was wasn't worth being in and mm. but i found a company that had a real good bonding process you know that would bond the print to the uh, garment real well and we get we you can get hundreds of washes out of it and we started doing that in 12 and now we just bought one that's uh we were the first ones in the country to have it. It's a, uh, what they call it, it's made by Cornet. It's a poly, it's an Atlas Max Poly. And it does things, uh, 3D printing on shirts. It does um, polyester, it does cotton, it does the tri-blends, it does 50-50. And now they're starting to get more people to do it and it just does a great job. And the bonding process is perfect. I mean, it's just, Fabulous. You know, yeah, in that industry with branding, you can probably go in a billion different directions oh. with a billion different machines and, and all that. So are there are, are there elements that I, I'm sure you've trialed a whole bunch of stuff, but are there elements that are your, your main go to is like screen printing or the embroidery or anything like that? We tr we used to do we used to farm out our screen printing um, the direct to garments where we are. It's okay. just it, it what it does. The direct to garment just makes the small jobs, the full color stuff, just so affordable, mm -hmm. you know, cause you don't have to do all the setup charges. Right. So, I mean, if you can provide us with a, with some good artwork, you know, computer generated artwork, you know, we can print it you know, no problem. So those are our wide format printers there that we do like graphics and stickers and all kinds of things on. We can even uh, do some color transfers on it if we have to. Those you're seeing right there, those are our lasers. And we've got two of them. Both are CO2 lasers and fiber. Uh, we also do sand carving, so we can etch glass, um, glasses. We can even, uh, we have we even have a process where we can paint them. UV printer was back there. The big machine you see to the kind of the right back there, that's our new Max Poly. Again, there's our wide format printers right there. And then that's all the different vinyls that we need to, to do what we have to do. Because every, every application has a different vinyl to it. And we can even print like papers and um, photos. We can take photos and enlarge and we can do wallpapers. So watch this. Now this is, this has to have a certain humidity content inside there. So it's putting the pre-treat down. Now it comes over with the white and it'll do the white base first. Now those steamers are keeping the humidity level real high. Holy crap, that keep was fast. It, We keep it at 50. Now this has, um, there's nine print heads on this, this particular head. And then on the next one, there's 12 print heads. So that's how come we can get so fast. Wow. Now it's done printing the white. So it prints the base white and the highlight white. And then it comes back and it does the colors. And it dries the white fast enough to apply the second color? It doesn't have to. This, is, this thing is all wet on wet technology and uh. it's just, yeah, nobody else really does it like this. That's just amazing. So when this thing pops out, the color, the vibrancy is just beyond belief. So we used all the color banks on this. We used the CMYK with the neon channels to get the brightness that we need. So this was a retro shirt that they were doing for the Unadilla uh, motocross nationals that they printed up, I don't know how many years ago, probably 20 and still had the artwork. And then now we're reproducing it on here. 
So, so give me a little bit of a background on, you know, how did you get, how did you start Mind Rocket? You kind of, kind of, how did you get into becoming a, a recording engineer and producer? Oh man, that's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. We got, uh, we got time. We got time. Uh, um, my buddy John Halumik from the Infidels, uh, he and John Corey, the drummer for the Infidels, bought a four track in, I don't know, maybe 1984. And I would help him and monkey around with that and once in a while borrow it for the weekend. And I'm like, I really love doing this. It's, it's a cool thing, you know, even when there was no technology, nothing, mm. you know, like there is today. And um, that just kind of set me on the path. Uh, I got into a car accident in 1991 and um, got a decent amount of money to be able to just start buying some gear. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was playing in the Heretics at the time, so just took all that. Uh, gear and started the studio basically. So, what sort of you know, uh, what kind of artists, what sort of genres are you kind of re recording at Monarch? You're pretty much all over the place, aren't you? I am all over the place. Um, I do a little bit of rap, not as much as I did years ago. Um, Americana, uh, stoner rock, metal, punk rock, a lot of punk rock. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference? Is there, uh, you know, is there a genre you like recording more than more than others, perhaps? I would say no. Um, I th because I listen to all those those mm. things, so um, no, as, as long as the band's into what they're doing, I'm I'm into helping them do their thing the best that they can. Okay, that's the uh, the control room. That's a 1976 MCI 428 that was modified by Don Garvin in uh, New Brighton, PA, in the 80s to be a little clearer and less. Uh, noisy and more transient response than the original 428s mm -hmm. so um that's kind of the main backbone there and then the rack is just compressors and preamps and things that i like to use for my sessions yeah it seems like there's a it, it, w w when you get a recording i mean you can go down some serious rabbit holes as far as gear goes yeah my sweetwater credit card can attest to that rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> And I, I don't think I'm going to stop anytime soon. I, I, I love buying gear, and I try to make one at least one big purchase a year, and then small maintenance and microphones and other mm -hmm. stuff you know throughout the year as well. Uh, my old studio was in the basement of my house. It was a really hard load in. There was no natural light. And when I was decided I was going to move, all I wanted was an easy load in and some natural light. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> as, as far as the comfort goes, uh, the natural light's actually covered right there because we were doing the video. But um, it, I spend so much time there, I, I want to be comfortable there. And I, and I know if a band feels comfortable, they're going to perform mm -hmm. a lot better than they would if they were, you know, felt rigid and confined yeah. and stuff like that. And so what uh, what gear do you have kind of in studio, too? I mean, I, some of this is probably the band because this was, this was a post-Ramon was there for a, a, a Mind Rocket session. But, yeah, what, what sort of in-house gear do you guys ha do you have? All those amps that you're looking at against the back wall and also a Laney VH100R. I have another Vox amp that's not in the shot. And um, I think that's all for amplifiers. I'm trying to think of what I might have at home. And... Uh, I have a P bass that I keep there, you know, if someone would need it, and uh, a Gibson Melody Maker guitar that's mine that mm -hmm. I still play, but I album just used it last week. Mm -hmm. So, it's, you know, getting into recording, I mean, was it just kind of a, a? I guess how do you get good at it? Is it just just a whole lot of trial and error, a whole lot of it, hours? It is. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm still getting good at it. I I, I haven't stopped trying to perfect my craft, mm -hmm. which is. Um, Probably the, the the reason that I still do this and I still have bands coming in because I try to get better constantly. Um, yeah, so, is there anything that you've recorded in the past that you kind of go back and listen to and like, ah, oh, man, that could be better? Or, and like, do you ever go back and like tweak oh, old recordings? Sometimes for fun, I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I think that's the part of the learning process. Is I, I never listen to anything and say, man, that's perfect. Mm. You know, there's always something I'm like, man, I wish I. Had, you know, would have done this with a bass different or, you know, the vocals are too loud or something like that. But uh, as time moves on, I've found where the certain pockets of things should sit and mm. how to make them sit in that pocket. So, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely a, an ever-changing learning experience. Mm -hmm. 
This episode was brought to you by Youngstown Computer, the Valley's technology company. We appreciate the loyalty and all you have shown us over the years, and it's our promise to serve all the technology needs of the Valley. Call 330-259-7278. We have both home and business services available. Everything from repair, installations, and new equipment. You can improve your Wi-Fi and have technology serve you better. Call 330-259-7278. Or you can schedule your appointment right now on youngstowncomputer.com and look for the red Book Now button. All right, welcome to Behind the Scenes in Studio. Today we have Derek McDowell with the Youngstown Flea. So Derek, why don't you tell our viewers how everything kind of got started and maybe some of your history as well. Sure. Um, you know, native son of the city of Youngstown. Um, found myself in corporate America, just trying to provide for my family. Um, but I always had this creative background. I was a visual artist growing up, drawing cartoons and comics and all that stuff. Uh, but corporate America kind of kept me busy. And I found myself doing some consulting work for an owner of the Harley Davidson shop in Austin town. Uh, but it was it was a unique opportunity where he sent me to travel and explore the motorcycle world. I mean, I was watching all the old school motorcycle movies and, you know, just finding that culture in Miami and Denver and L.A. and New York. But um, each time I got to travel, you see uh, a lot of that culture and creativity coming out in these neighborhoods. So I found myself in um, this area of Miami called Wynwood, where they had... And the entire neighborhood was being graffitied by commission, you know, large scale murals, anything, galleries, empty, vacant buildings were turning into apparel pop up brands. Uh, and they had, you know, parking lots filled with food trucks. And there was a there was a guy who had a U-Haul truck he had rented opened up the garage or the door of the U-Haul truck. They had a DJ in there. Mm. They wrapped the U-Haul wow. truck with, with that brown butcher paper. They were letting people just walk up and throw paint at the truck. You know what I mean? And it's like, and then you come home to Youngstown mm -hmm. and you're like, hang on a second. You know what I mean? Like, I want all of that. I just want it here where I'm from. And I just thought like, I know it's here. I know it exists. And then I was kind of looking around for somebody else to do the idea you know, again, I'm nudge him and say, hey, yeah, it's like, hey, <laughs> you know, I found a market in Canfield, actually, that it popped up. I went and visited him and I'm like, hey, I think this idea would be really great. And you could do it on a grander scale in the city of Youngstown. And they just blew me off like, no, you know, and, and Youngstown has its tough reputation. Right. And so that was probably a little bit of apprehension for them. But I just knew from 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 just the deep down travel that I would see what these creative markets would do for communities and helping folks to be feel welcome, uh, giving a platform to creatives and makers. And I'm like, no, we deserve it. And I went back to that, those, those hosts of that market. And I'm like, if you don't do it, like I'm going to do it. And they, they just kind of blew me off again. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh yeah, we'll meet with you. And, uh, and, you know, we never could get a meeting. And so I just said, hey, listen, I don't know anything about doing this, but I know we deserve it. And I just become a student of it. Now I'm like going to different markets trying to study how how to gather and pull this creative, um, you know, subset of our community together. And, you know, we pulled it off. OK, so the uh, like the first iteration of the flea um assuming it was it's not as big as it is. Sure. Today. What did yeah. that look like? Paint the picture. I began with this. You know, a very visual guy, again, I grew up drawing that way. I have to sort of see things. And so in my mind, I see a Broadway play. And I'm not kidding. And so for me, it's like Broadway plays, the start is pulling back the curtain. And so I'm like, where is the best place to pull back the curtains? And it was like downtown. And I need it to be like super stage you know what i'm saying right. like the best location like I, I just imagine the most i know about bra is like you know here's juilliard you know if you're going to do a performance musically or uh, and so i'm thinking like yeah that's it so i come downtown and i see the cavelli center and i'm like that's it you know right and so i, I approached cavelli and this was again years ago right and they were like we don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> like and i'm like all right cool so i go next door and um the jamming it family. I actually went to see Rich Mills who owned Ohio one at the time. And I, and we're looking out his window 
And I'm like, you know who owns that parking lot right there? And he's like, I don't know. You know, go check with the Jaminettes. So this is me like on the hunt every day trying to figure out how to get that parking lot. Finally connected with the Jaminette family. And uh, it was months of just negotiating and having, they always believed in the idea. And I'm thankful to them for that. Uh, but it was just, all they knew was renting their parking lot for parking. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about popping up a flea market in their mind. And I'm like thinking experience. I'm describing this Broadway play to them. <laughs> you know what I'm like? Hey, buying the vision. Right? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, insurance liability, <laughs> sir. Let's, let's start with that. Uh, and so fast forward, we, I got the call and I'd been calling their secretary every Monday. I told her one time, I said, you know, the best way to get rid of me is to give me a yes. And, and one, so one day I call, it's Monday, and a, and a guy picks up the phone. And I'm like, this is different because every Monday it'd be a, a girl, you know, a woman. And he, he goes, yeah, can I help you? And I'm like, yeah, this is Derek trying to start this plea. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you can use the parking lot. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like, is that real? You know what I mean? Like, he sounded like he was trying to get rid of me. He was like, yeah, we talked about it. You're fine. And I'm like, sweet. That was like literally – I would say January 24th of 2016 by February 1st. Right. So give me four or five days to a week. And I built the logo, the website and, you know, started social media and like put the word out and it just exploded. So fast forward to the day of the first flea, April 2016, and we were set to go 11 to four. So we got the venue, the Broadway play. I woke up at like 3 o'clock in the morning. My vendors are starting to come at 6. Uh, we get the tables, chairs, everything set up. And it's probably 9.30, and I tell my wife, I'm like, I'm disgustingly nasty right now from just all this setup. I'm going to go home, I'm going to shower, and I'll be back by 11, you know, for the market. Vendors are all set in place. We had about 38 vendors that I was able to convince. I had no clue how the community will respond. So I leave, go home, take the quickest shower I can take. And, um, I come back. It's probably 10, 10, 20. I get off 680 on South Avenue and my wife's calling me and she's like repeatedly calling. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, you know, any guy, I'll see her in a few minutes and she can tell me whatever she wanted to tell me. She calls back again. I'm like, honey, what is it? And she goes, you got to hurry up and get back here. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but for whatever stupid reason, like I'm in a traffic jam on South Avenue, which is like never happened. I don't know what the heck's going on. And she goes, well, dummy, that's everybody trying to get into the flea. Whoa. Like we had traffic backed up. She said traffic's backed up Market Street Bridge and South Avenue. Wow. And she goes, this is not my market. This is yours. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to make it back. Like wow. there was so much traffic. And so, um, it was, it was like exactly what I envisioned. You know what I mean? It wasn't perfect, but to me, it was just like the perfect display of us. Mm -hmm. Then I get a call at the time from Mike McGiffin, who was the events coordinator. And I'm thinking like, Mike's probably like so pissed off at me that I didn't give him a better heads up. Like I had no clue it was right. going to be this successful. And uh, I call, and I was pretty like aggressive when I answered the phone with Mike. And I'll go, "Hey, if you're calling to try and shut this thing down, man, you're gonna you're gonna have a time on your hands because like it's obvious the community. I'm getting all this out before Mike could even say a <laughs> word. And he goes, "Hey, man, I just wanted to call and congratulate you. Whoa, nice. You know what I mean? He goes, "You just changed the game for downtown. And he's like, "Like, thank you. You know what yeah. I mean? And it was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> This episode was brought to you by Youngstown Computer, the Valley's technology company. We appreciate the loyalty and all you have shown us over the years, and it's our promise to serve all the technology needs of the Valley. Call 330-259-7278. We have both home and business services available. Everything from repair, installations, and new equipment. You can improve your Wi-Fi and have technology serve you better. Call 330-259-7278, or you can schedule your appointment right now on youngstowncomputer.com and look for the red Book Now button.
So we, yeah. we love entrepreneurs around here. And, and there's one thing about it that it's not an easy game to play. It sure so isn't. how did you get your, <laughs> like, where did you learn about business and, and what made you think that, you know, that was the, the better track for you? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of odd because I had no business background, like zero. Um, I will say my uncle, um, I did get to watch him. He built a um, restaurant business basically from the bottom up and he's like thriving now. He's out in Struthers. Um, he owns Don Vito's. So besides like seeing that, you know, knowing like how much work goes into it, how much dedication, I really had zero business knowledge at all. So the first thing I did was go out and find um, a group of other cleaning business entrepreneurs. And it's kind of like a mentorship. So, nice. yeah. So um, I started a group with that and that really helped the business aspect of everything. You know, it helps teach you about your finances. Um, it helps teach you about, you know, the processes that you want to put in place for your business. So like training, hiring training, um, you know, just the day-to-day -day things that need done in a business. So that was really what helped me. And obviously there's still like a ton of learning that you do along the way. But if I hadn't um, joined that group early on and it was about a year into the business. So if I hadn't done that, I feel like I probably be, would be like, just like the other statistics and like not have made it. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's Cause not it, an easy haul. There's a lot of stuff working against you. So much. Yeah. You make mistakes that mm -hmm. end up like rearing up down the road and yeah. you, like, face them down and think, Oh, that was my stupidity. Yeah. Right like why <laughs> didn't I do this right from the beginning? So that really helped. I will say like anyone, that's like a huge piece of advice that I have for anyone who doesn't have a background in business to really, you don't really have to pay, but at least connect yourself with somebody who is either doing what you're doing and doing it better. Cause I always say you, you don't want to um, follow along with people that aren't on the same level as you are. So you always want to find people that are doing what you're doing even better. So you can push yourself to be better. Um, or, you know, get like a, a group of, you know, like-minded people and they can help you along the way but you have to have some sort of support if you don't have any kind of you know business background you got to have support or you're just gonna make mistake after mistake and yeah. but you get to tell <laughs> stories at the end of the day right like, oh yeah yeah when? all right let's get into our narration video here okay. and um i guess uh, if anything notable care free or feel free to explain okay so yeah, our girls, um, I'm able to pay my staff a little bit more. We kind I don't know how other cleaning businesses do it around here, but our girls like carry all of their things with them. Um, we provide all this stuff for them, but then they keep them at their homes, they maintenance at their homes. So they're able to drive right to their house and they don't have to spend that time stopping at the office, then going to their house. So it's kind of nice, especially for moms, because like if they have to go drop the kids off, they drop the kids off, then they run into the office, then they go. So now they're able to have everything in. Um, the back of their car, and they're able to just go straight to work. So it's really nice. But that's Paige. That's one of our cleaners. Do you hire only people named Paige? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a common name. So when she when she put an application, I was like, oh, I have to I have to meet her. But yeah, no, no, we have others. So you know, when the girls have their routine clients, like they. Um, they make a routine out of the cleaning. It's a systemized clean. So they start like top to bottom, left to right, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, they have certain tools that they use in certain places and, um, you know, trying to make sure they're touching every surface and every room so that way the dust and dirt doesn't accumulate over time. And, and so at, as you can see, the, you know, this is not a luxury service. I mean, at one time, maybe the people that could afford those kind of things were the only the people that did it. But this yes, is busy li lives. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, now is it a usually weekly services? So I, the most common is biweekly, bi which is every other week. I don't typically recommend monthly unless it's like a budget issue um, because most homes – a month for four weeks is almost too long. If you're not tackling things in between, you're doing more of a deeper clean every time. So I do recommend biweekly for families, people with pets, things like that. Some people luckily live in houses that don't accumulate a lot of dust and, and they can make it a month, but we typically recommend that those biweekly cleanings. And you're right. Like I try to keep, and I know we might be more expensive than like your mom and pop people that just, you know, they might have you know, um, 1099 employees or something like that. Ours are all W-2. We are fully insured. You know, we, our staff, they, we pay them very well because we want to create a job where, you know, they like what they do. They feel valued and you're going to be able to trust them in their, in your home. Like to me, that's, 
I'd rather pay an employee more and take some out of my pocket to make sure that our clients are being well cared for and that they're getting a service and someone in their home that they can trust is not worried that they're going to steal from them or things like that. And so you got a lot of lot of vehicles on the lot. You said 5,000? Yeah, we have 5,000 um, vehicles on the lot and um, we're constantly every day buying fresh inventory. Between the two businesses last month, we bought 900 cars. Man, that's awesome. Between auto wrecking and you pull it, yeah. All right, so let's watch our, our video here. All right, so there's our office. Um, it says right there that sign, we do offer aftermarket parts. So what's nice about that is we um, we have a company that will deliver us aftermarket parts typically the next day. So whenever you need your new bumper covers, your hoods, maybe you, we don't have them used or you're not interested in used, we can get the brand new stuff. Just like what people order from like Rock Auto and Amazon and stuff, we can get that stuff as well. There's our office. We got um, experienced uh, sales team members up there right there. We're shipping out motors and trannies, rear ends. That's all stuff that's leaving on freight in the semi truck. And like I said, that comes and goes every morning and every evening. And these are shops that are looking to source some things yep, that are hard to find. Call us, you know, people, just, um, regular retail customers, other salvage yards. So we, our inventory is listed on, a, um, on a program that that we're on with all the top tier salvage yards throughout the United States, and we all trade off parts, and you know they all call us whenever they get a customer that needs something. So this is our pad where we get fresh inventory. Um, whenever the tow trucks bring them in, we'll bring them to the back there. There's one of our machines we use to set cars. There's our truck uh, our truck garage where the delivery trucks pull in and out and get loaded up. Those right there is um, those are just some money cores that. You know, whenever we, whenever we sell a uh, a transmission or a motor, you got to give us your old one. So those were just getting prepared to get shipped out so they can get refurbished. Looks like here we're going into our little quality control area. So what we try to do is we try to clean up every part and just inspect it before it leaves to our customer. Um, that was something new that we had implemented the past year just to make sure that our customers are getting the best experience and. And then it helps us to notice if there's any issues or flaws in the parts that we can relate to our salesmen to get to the uh, get that information to the customer. So whenever you buy a hood or a door, we clean it up real nice to make sure, you know, it is it is what it's supposed to be. This is the yard. Something that we also started the past couple of years is putting these. Um, whenever we disassemble the cars, we put them up on stands now, and then that way, that just helps our parts pullers get to the part quicker, easier, uh, staying nice and organized, and. Uh, this is actually how the whole you pull it yard is. So we have ha about half of the Youngstown auto wrecking yard. Traditional salvage yards, you go to them, and most of the cars are, you know, in the dirt and on the ground. Well, we like to keep them up in the air so that it keeps our doors and bumpers nice, and it's easy to get to the suspension. 